Our next speaker is uh, Tom Belt, Cherokee. Tom is coordinator for the Western Carolina University Cherokee Language Program. He is working to create a state-of-the-art Cherokee language program at the university level. Mr. Bell teaches the first four semesters of Cherokee language and teaches courses on Cherokee grammar and Cherokee language literature. Belt is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, a fluent Cherokee speaker, and works closely with speakers from the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians to produce culturally-based Cherokee language learning material. Before joining the Cherokee language program, Mr. Belt worked as a counselor's aide in a local treatment center for native youth with chemical dependence issues. He attended the universities of Oklahoma and Colorado and taught the Cherokee language at the Cherokee Elementary School in North Carolina. He also has served as a consultant to various cultural archives and indigenous language programs in public schools and on the post-secondary level. Tom? Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that um, everyone can hear this. Uh, I want to thank the Smithsonian <clears throat> and, um, and uh, my friend Jose and his colleagues for allowing um, me to speak here uh, t today in or, um, or allowing me to be here today. Uh, we are here uh, this week um, uh, attending a conference whose thrust it was to examine the health and well-being uh, of um, Native Americans, the current state of that. And during the course of these last two days, we've examined many things and gone over a lot of things from many different uh, aspects. And I'm grateful for that. And I also want to think, thank, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is getting a little bad. Uh, I also want to thank, um, um, in lieu of what's been said about the role of women, which is also the way in which our tribe in particular works on a matrilineal uh, um, spectrum, I'm, I, I have to say it this way then, I have to thank my elders, my betters, uh, Louise and Beverly for their their presentations, and I hope that I can um, um, shed a, a another aspect to what they were talking about so um, um, so fluently and so articulately. It is um, it is a basic truth that everyone knows, it's a, a basic scientific truth, that the content of any culture, of any culture on the face of the earth, is ultimately expressed in its language. The analogies of its cosmology, its worldview, and basically the purpose of that culture is to be understood only through, only by more th thoroughly understanding its language. The most integral part that a language carries is, is a concept is is a concept of cosmology. It leads to the understanding of place, which leads to understanding one's purpose. One's purpose is one's identity, it is said. And in that purpose then we begin to understand a little bit more clearly the truth in all of creation. It is important to understand this concept because language, the language of a culture has encoded in it millennia upon millennia of experience and wisdom concerning those geographical areas that it comes from 
and the people who express it. In the Cherokee language, there are certain terms that indicate that this is a truth. We have, for example, the term do you die? Do you die can be interpreted and used to mean the right way, the correct way. It can also mean the straight way. Straight from here. This line that we speak of historically has been used to teach and to uh, remind the members of our people who speak this language and who use this of that purpose of life. It is a long, long line, this do you don't need this line, this truth, this direct way, and it's very narrow. And it is hard to stay on, but that is a part of life that we also understand. This line does not does not divide into two parts. It is simply the central line of one part, and all things are on that line, all the good and all the bad, and we understand that, those things that can happen, just as surely as there is life, just as surely as there is death, just as surely as there is night and day, and wet places and dry places, on the face of the earth, all at the same time. We understand this duality as being one thing. With that concept of that comes from our cosmology in the way in which we were intended to be here, the language comes to us to be able to understand these things, to, to make it possible for us to exist from day to day in a correct manner. Out of these words in our language, we, we have formed many, many words, many words, as in all languages. It is estimated by some linguists that our language being a polysyllabic language, meaning that we have verbs which are complete uh, sentences in English, each sound, each sound carries with it a meaning, which is a part of a sentence. For example, agiyoshi ha in Cherokee means in English, I am hungry. It is a complete sentence. The I and the action are included in that one word. To the extent of a simple word, I mean, from a simple word like that to a more complex word like which is one word which means when they have almost finished giving permission to you and I from a distance. All of that, all in one word. It is complex, and as I said, some, and, 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 I was, and as I was beginning to say, some linguists estimate that a Cherokee word can be conjugated 20,000 times. And I believe this is true with other languages. I believe it is the same. I'm not telling you that I know 20,000 ways to say I'm hungry. In fact, I probably wouldn't get past the first five, maybe. <laughs> but in truth, because of the nature of language, if I were to hear that 19,999 way, if it were on a list, I would understand it because the codes of our language mean that we can understand those things and that we can put those things together. This is the nature of our language. This is as far as I'm going to get in my uh, lecture about uh, language grammar here. I know <laughs> I teach language and I know just, just how boring it can get and how boring I can get when we talk about that. But essentially the thing that I want to share with you is, uh, is that language affords us a vision, an emotion. It gives us a sense of place on the face of the earth. The word Cherokee, for example, is not even a Cherokee word. We have no 
meaning for that word. It wasn't brought to her. I, it wasn't. Uh, it it wasn't of our own language. It was brought to us. The word that we call ourselves is Anigaduhuagin, which means the people of Katua, and the and Katua is a town which is located about eight miles from the present site of the uh, Koala Boundary in Cherokee, North Carolina, where resides the Eastern Band. And Katua then is the name that we have taken for millennia upon millennia. This is what we call ourselves, much like the same way one would call themselves Americans or Washingtonians. Uh, we have a town nearby named Asheville, and I haven't figured out whether there are, they are Ashevilleites or Ashevillains. But then, I'm not an expert on English, and that's not the reason why I'm here. But that is what we call ourselves, the people of Katua. Many times, many people over the years, because of the depletion of the language and the loss of it, many people have tried to find, uh, have, have had many interpretations of what that means. Earlier I said that language defines things. T to give you an example of how complex this is, the word Ketua actually comes from the um, linguistic way of spelling the word Gidua. Uh, linguists in the uh, t t 20th century wrote K's for G's and KH's for K's. I'm not really for sure why they did that. It just seems confusing. But they did do that. And so when we saw the name, when, we saw, when uh, people saw the word written K-I-T-U-W-A-H, they naturally said Ketua. And it's actually pronounced Gidua. Gidua comes, that town's name comes from two words in Cherokee. One is Gada and Uha'i. Gada meaning soil, meaning dirt, and Uha'i meaning a, is a possessory verb, meaning it belongs to a third person, his, his property or it belongs to him, it belongs to her. We have no um, uh, gender-specific words in the th third person. It, it could also be, it belongs to it. But God then means the soil or the dirt that belongs to a third party or a third person. And in this case, then we would say that it belongs, that third person is the uh, creator. So the, 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 the uh, soil that belongs to the creator that was what we called our mounds, which on top of were our council houses where our fires were kept. This dirt that belongs to the creator, God Uhani, then became conjugated to the people that lived around this mound then. It became a contracted form of those two words, God Uhani, becoming God Uhani. And so now all towns are called God Uhani even Washington, and even Asheville. Gadu Ha'in. To further complicate things then, if you internalize that word and make it possessory, then you can say things like our town, your town, um, Udu Ha'in, his town, uh, Udu Ha'in, um, um, Ha'in, our town, in the old way in which we spoke, which we, um, many things have changed, it would have been said, our town, and that's what we named our, and that was our very first town, that is a town in which is the place of the origin of our people, Gidua. And we were Ani Gidua again, which means the people of the soil. If you wish to translate it, it means the people of the soil that belongs to the Creator. At the bottom of that mound, we say that it doesn't, as the mound begins to contour and go down and and starts to uh, level off. It doesn't mean the end of that mound because there is no wall there. 
there is nothing that separates that from the land around it. So Ketua must then, in our way of thinking, continue on down that mound and up the next mountain and over it and over the next one and over the next one until the very shores of the oceans. Because certainly the land in which we live on is the soil that belongs to the Creator. It doesn't belong to us. There is much to speak about in this cosmology and the way in which we talk about it, but as I am indicating, the language carries the code of that. It tells us who we are, it tells us where we are, and it tells us why we are who we are. This right way of looking at the world is not, as has been in the past, a superstition, it is not a myth. It is not a cute cultural property. I don't believe that any of us in any tribes sat around for 30,000 years and woke up every morning, cooked some beans, and said, well, what kind of story are we going to make up this day? How are we going to define something? Let's just make it up as a as I said, encoded in, the language is a scientific approach, a, a way of looking at the world that's not defined through other languages. Only we can define it that way because we lived there. The Haudenosaunee people, the people of the Long House in the north, know their country. They've been there for, for thousands of years. The people of the southwest know their country. It is different from ours. It is a, it is a part of their language. For example, in our language, we can denote going uphill, downhill, upstream, and, down, and uh, downstream. It indicates a knowledge of place. It's encoded in the language. This, to understand place, begins to obligate then. It is not just wisdom, it is not just knowledge. It is not just knowing what's behind the next mountain or around the next bend. This knowing is an obligation. The burden of awareness, the burden of awareness in native lives in every tribe has always been responsibility. If you know something, then you are responsible for it in some form. And the responsibility that we have from the knowledge that we've gained over thousands of years. This understanding and this obligation comes about in the form of being grateful. Being grateful for what we have been given. This gratefulness should manifest in a correct stewardship. And, a, and this sense of uh, responsibility should manifest itself in correct behavior. The correct way to look at the world, once again, do you the, the, the correct way, the straight way, the way in which we have always tried to follow. It does not result, there's a difference between responsibility and, and entitlement. We have never been entitled to anything. We are here only for a short journey. We are here to be grateful for this trip. We are grateful to, we, we are here to be grateful for this journey. And in this gratefulness, one has to understand that we must be then like visitors. For surely this does not belong to us, does it? As I explained a little bit earlier, we are the people of, the soil that belongs to the Creator. We stand on this. This is our floor. We stand under the roof, the sky that was given us. And we as Cherokees stand inside the walls that, uh, that, that were given us in the forms of the mountains in which we live in. And we share this with our betters. We share this with all of the animals, with all of the birds, with all of the fish, with everything 
that lives here, for surely they were here before we were, and this is also a scientific fact. They were here, we say, before we ever came. We indicate this by saying we don't even have names. All the names were given out. Yona, Jistu, Jistu, all of these words that mean bear, rabbit, bird. These names were all given out. We as human beings have no names. We are just, you know, we. So we had to borrow names, didn't we? Names like wolf, names like bird, names that coincide with events or things in the uh, natural world. We had to borrow these names because all the names were given out before we got here. This indicates that we were not here first. We also understood that everything has to be here all birds, all animals. If we lose one of these things, if all the birds in the world die tomorrow, we do not have long as, as a life form on this earth. None of us do. And so it is with animals, so it is with fish, so it is with insects, and so it is with plants. If these things disappear, the earth ceases to be in its natural state. But tomorrow morning, if we disappear as human beings, nothing happens except the water begins to clear up, the air begins to clear up, and life becomes, to get, and life becomes better and purer on the face of the earth. To have that status, to be that, is not a bad thing. It is once again related to the idea then you must instill in your culture, you must have a sense of gratefulness for just being here, for just being allowed here, for surely this does not belong to us. In that method that we evolved, in that way of understanding how the world works, this is pure science. This is accumulated wisdom. This is accumulated knowledge over millennia. This language exhibits that. This language contains that understanding. So without it, we not only understand the world, we, not, we do not understand the world, we do not understand how things work, and we do not understand why we are here. So it leads us to make use of everything around us in whatever manner we can. And this is immoral, and this is not science, and it is not right. It is not do you dumb. This is what the language affords us. It is, it is more than all these things, and I say to you this afternoon that the language contains what we call the sacred. It is sacred. By that, all things should be sacred. By that, I mean that science should be sacred. Science without conscience is not science. It's only greed. It's only arrogance. Science with a conscience means that it has wisdom. It imparts wisdom. And we know what to do tomorrow and the day after that to keep it such, to keep it straight, to keep it do you dying. In our language, we have two sounds, the O and the O. And, and the E, and it comes out O-E. This sound permeates our language in various forms. For example, the word tohi. Tohi in our language can mean th three separate things. If I say to you, or if I ask you, tohi guju, I'm asking you if you are well, physically well or mentally well, anyway, in any form, well. It can also mean that one is moving slow. For example, if you have friends and one is lagging behind, they would say, tohi ahi, he is walking, we say slower. But when you view that from a realistic point of view of that person who's walking slower, isn't he walking or isn't, or he, or isn't she walking unstressed, unhurried? Isn't she walking or he walking at their own pace? 
we say this is how the waters run. This is how a creek runs. This is how rivers run. Whether it's running fast or slow, it is moving at its own space, at its own pace. It is tohi. And the last way we use it is to indicate peace, serenity. We would say tohi, he dead on him. We are at peace. We are at a point of serenity. Tohi, deha. There is no war. There is no stress. There is no urgency. There is no hurry. We're moving at our own space, at, at, at our own pace, and we are moving in that direction. We are moving that way in health. This OE then, perme- then uh, shows up in other forms of our language. From a grammatical point of view, it shows up in the um, habitual form of, of our verbs. While ago, I used the word agiosi, ha, huh, meaning I am hungry. I could say agiosi, sko, i, o, i again. And that means I'm always hungry. And many of my friends call me that anyway, especially my wife. But it indicates a habitual form of that word. It means an eternal form of that ver- word in, its, uh, in and of itself. It means that there is no end to it. It's always that way. So if it's always that way, doesn't it also mean that it is a true fact of life then? If something is always that way, it is a fact of life. And our word for truth is udo hi yu, do hi yu. So you can see how that sound permeates our language, meaning things that are true, meaning things that are all those things that I mentioned. It indicates that we had a belief in this system, that we believed if we spoke that way, then we lived that way, or we tried to live that way, with all the understandings that come with it. This is the importance of language. It is not only our language that's like that. It is the language of every indigenous tribe in this country, and maybe worldwide. Maybe all the languages worldwide, they're indigenous, but surely all the languages of the world. There are some 6,000 languages left on the face of the earth. We don't know how many languages there were just 400 years ago. But these languages are in jeopardy. These languages are dying. With the loss of languages, we will become a monolingual society. With the loss of these languages also means then, as I've explained, the loss of those cultures. The way that we interpreted the world, the way in which we interpreted the world, our worldview, this will be gone. And this worldview was garnered and honed over thousands of years. With the loss of that is a loss, is a great loss to all of us. Without the Mohawk people, without the Diné, without the other 500 tribes in this country and their languages, we cannot understand the width and breadth of this land because we as Cherokees did not live in the desert. We We did not live in the north. We did not live on the ice. Only they could explain to us the essence and the wisdom of those places, language and and combine it is a volume of wisdom and scientific fact biologi- biologically historically of the world as we know it to lose that is like losing history books it's losing our own history the history of mankind this is the importance of language And this is what the effort and thrust of many tribes are at this time to revitalize and to bring back those languages. As you heard among the Mohawk people, they are teaching these languages. (coughs) Excuse me. They're teaching these languages to, to their young people. Young people are the hope of all of our tribes. We were told once a long time ago that to not teach your children your language 
was in fact an act of theft. The language did not belong to you. It was given to you. Your responsibility was to hand it down. To not teach your children the language was to withhold from them who they were. It is theft. Much has happened. And, as, and we can talk about the plethora of social ills and disparities that we have faced over the past three or 400 years that have resulted in the conditions we have now. But the way in which we come to grips with this in a better understanding is to understand, first of all, that our languages must be allowed to thrive. They must be allowed to grow and they must be allowed to flourish. Because in this way, the codes that it carries with it is the only way that we can resolve these problems. Therein lies the answer. Therein lies the methods in which we can look at the world for certainly a language that gives us the concept of the right way, the correct way, the eternal way. A language that gives us a sense of tohi, of wellness and health, cannot lead us down the wrong way. After all, it was used for thousands of years, and we did a pretty good job of it. This is what I have to offer you this afternoon by way of thanks and by, and, uh, and, and, and by way of gratitude for allowing me to be here and participate in these events that happened to all those who did. This is my way of acknowledging that responsibility not just to a sound, not just to a tool, but to you as individuals. Because we share this land, we share this place. And if all, and if all that has been taught us is correct, then we have to show our gratitude to each other and we have to join hands and, want, and, and begin the revitalization not of our language not only of our languages but of who we are and this is the tool that can be used i do not speak mohawk i do not speak seneca i do not speak onondaga i do not speak dene i do not speak any of the other languages but i understand that they carry the same weight they carry the same value and more importantly, they carry the same truth. That being said, then I trust them. I believe in them because what they are saying and what they are doing is right. This is the way in which we will bring ourselves out of this system. This is how we will restore health to our people, restore health to our children, and maybe maybe help others to restore health to this world, to the environment. This is the gift of language. This is what we need to recognize in all facets. Language is a gift that was given us to understand these things. And more importantly, not just to understand them, but to be this way, to be this language. In our tribes, when we put forth the effort to, revital, uh, to revitalize our language, I assure you we are not making language speakers. When we do this among the Cherokee, we are not creating language speakers. We are creating Cherokees. And such it is with every language. When this is done among the Mohawks, you are creating Mohawks. To create life with this understanding is a sacred thing. That is what the language means to us, and this is what I have to offer. And I thank you so much for listening to me. Hello. Thank you.